I call to order the spring congregational meeting of the First Unitarian Universalist Church of San Antonio, the 16th of May, 2021. Good morning. On behalf of the board, I welcome all of you to a, another very unique congregational meeting during the continued COVID worldwide epidemic. We continue to do the work of the church as we have for the last year, just differently. We will be discussing six topics today, four of which we will ask you to vote on. Mary Barad, on behalf of our social justice team and the Black Lives Matter Working Group, will discuss the adoption of a racial justice statement or resolution for our congregation. Donna Pereira, our church treasurer, will go over the highlights of next year's operational budget. Tess Bobo will speak on behalf of a bylaws change proposal. Reverend Mark, Justine Hansen, our Committee on Ministry Chair, and I will present our community agreements. And lastly, Reverend Mark and Gail, next year's president, will briefly discuss plans about the phased reopening of the church. A reminder, this event is not live and the chat room is not being moderated. At the conclusion of today's complete video, the church office via SurveyMonkey will send out the voting ballot. This is the same method we've used for the last year's congregational meeting and several subsequent special congregational meetings. You will have until midnight tonight to vote the ballot. Results will be tabulated and sent out to the congregation by noon tomorrow. We will also count the number of ballots received to count toward our quorum requirements. We have had two well-attended live Zoom town hall meetings where people had an opportunity to ask questions or comment about the topics under consideration today and speak with the minister and board members. Some changes may have been made as a result of those town hall meetings and you have already received any changes. The ballot will also reflect any changes that may have come about as a result of the town hall meetings. If you need technical assistance to help you vote we have set up several helplines, including the church office and my phone number. These are on the ballot and please use the helplines if you need to. A congregational meeting is difficult to coordinate under good circumstances. We believe we have done our best to get it done in the virtual world. I'd like to thank the board and Kathy McFarland for helping put together this year's congregational meeting, unique as it is. With that, I'd like to ask our minister, Mark Skrabatz, to please provide some opening words for our endeavors today and to light our chalice, symbol of our UU faith. Our opening words and chalice lighting are adapted from a poem by John Daniel. Among all the wonders of our lives, we are yet alive with one another, here in the light and darkness of this unlikely world. May we spend the time we are given generously. May we enact our responsibilities as thoroughly as we enjoy our pleasures. May we see with clarity our vision that serves all beings and our planet for now and for future generations. May we hold in our hands the gift of the good work we do for our sakes and for the sake of others, in justice, for love, and with the intention of living in harmony with one another and the divine. As is usual with congregational meetings, one of the first things we do is approve our meeting minutes from the previous year's meeting. Since we actually have a video record of our congregational meeting from last year, I have asked the church secretary, Heather Hedquist, to only do a brief written summary to serve as minutes. Those were included with the meeting call and will be the first item on your voting ballot to approve or disapprove. A note about the ballot you will receive today we have included a place for comments this year after each motion, in addition to simply voting yay, nay, or abstaining. You're encouraged to include comments as you wish. 
I would like to take a few moments this morning of personal privilege to provide a few comments about this past church year. As president and board, we have had many, many unique challenges to face. This time last year, we were only nine weeks into the pandemic. And most of us thought, naively it turns out, that we would be reopening our doors in a matter of months. In hindsight, I don't mind telling you, we had many trepidations about what lay ahead. Could we keep people connected? Would people respond to online services and Zoom meetings? Would people's jobs be affected to the point they couldn't maintain their pledges? Could we pay our employees? Was the minister who had been with us for barely four months willing to stay with us? We offered a bare bones budget. We took various federal loans just in case. Would we lose congregants to the disease? We locked the doors of our church and went home and stayed there for months, over a year. Fast forward to today. Today, we are a debt-free church, thanks to Charles and Virginia Bowden, who paid off the balance of our sanctuary mortgage, and to congregants who overpaid their pledges. We've actually brought in more dollars than we had planned. We saved some money from being closed, and we had the most successful stewardship campaign in the history of the church. During the town halls, I talked about our plans to spend over $100,000 on facilities improvements using money we have in the bank. And last but certainly not least, and thankfully, we lost no one in our congregation to the COVID virus. So it has been one crazy year. I'd like to thank all my fellow board members who helped steer the ship this year and say a special thanks to those leaving the board along with me at the end of the month. Donna Pereira, our treasurer extraordinaire, Heather Hedquist, our trusted board secretary, and Tess Bobo, member at large, who has served for three years. Thank you all. I'd also like to thank our minister, Reverend Mark Scrabutz. He has stuck with us and will be here for two and a half more years. He has been a great partner in this endeavor we call church. Lastly, thanks to you, the congregation, for putting your trust in us <clears throat> that we would get the job done the best way we could, all things considered. There's still plenty of work to do, but today our, our future certainly looks bright. What are your thoughts on the future of the church, Reverend Mark? He'll share the answer to that question during our close today. Best of luck to next year's board. Please give them the same wonderful support you gave us this past year. Now, let's begin with our first presenter, Mary Barad. Hello, my name is Mary Barad. I represent First UU Black Lives Matter Working Group and am active with our Social Justice Committee. We are asking today for your vote to approve our proposed racial justice statement. Our congregation currently has five other statements which declare our clear position on certain topics important to us and which embody our Unitarian Universalist values. These definitive statements are posted online and printed in our weekly order of service. Since the birth of our country, with the institution of slavery and the forced removal of indigenous peoples, there has been a system of racial injustice in America from which we still struggle to break free. Though generations of civil rights activists have achieved important gains in legal, political, social, educational, and other spheres, deep-seated ongoing inequities that have disadvantaged communities of color in the past still remain in the structure of our nation's institutions today. We can see this in the starkly segregated world of housing and economic opportunity. In our public schools, students of color are too often confined to underfunded and inferior programs. Our criminal justice system disproportionately targets people of color, often brutalizing them and incarcerating them at rates far exceeding that of other nations. Voting rights are again under attack from those who aim to disenfranchise people of color. 
the dream of equal justice remains an elusive one. Unitarian Universalists have historically been at the forefront of, of important social justice movements, and we will continue to listen, learn, and do the hard work required to address the power imbalances and racist behaviors that remain here in San Antonio and in our nation today in support of all who live under the crushing weight of discrimination. Our proposed racial justice statement reminds us as a church of our role in creating a world where we the people truly means all of us. This means working to dismantle the ongoing structural programs that discriminate on the basis of race and repairing centuries of harm inflicted on communities of color. By applying a racial equity lens to our church work, we are paying special disciplined attention to race and ethnicity. We believe we need to be clear on our stand. We are on the side of racial justice. So our resolution is simple. The proposed statement to be added to our current list is this. We are a congregation committed to racial equity and justice within ourselves, our church, and the wider community. We are a racial justice congregation. Thank you for your time and consideration. Hello, I'm Donna Pereira and I'm the outgoing treasurer and I'm here to briefly discuss the budget. Our successful stewardship campaign and the generous donation from the Bowdens made the job of the Finance Committee considerably easier this year. Steve Feinstein, Austin Subcheck, Reverend Mark and I worked hard to balance our needs with our financial wherewithal. I'd like to just take a few minutes to talk about some high points and changes on this budget that you're about to vote on. We are grateful for our dedicated employees. Those who have been working throughout the pandemic received a 4% raise. Those who have not been working during the past year got a 3% raise. It is unusual for a congregation our size to have a single minister. Reverend Mark has been working more than full time. It's become obvious to us that a second minister is needed. An assistant minister would be able to help with uh, pastoral care, social justice issues, and outreach to the greater San Antonio community, among other things. We hope to have someone hired by January, so we have budgeted for five months of pay and benefits. The annual salary is budgeted at $65,000. We are also aware that our funding for our religious education programs is well below average. In order to have an adult who can assist Sherry with RE classes and events, we have added $5,000 for a youth advisor. This is a contract position, not an employee, so it will not increase our payroll tax liability. Also in the religious education area, we added funding for the summer camp for parents nights out and for some UBAR youth scholarships. The total of those additions was just a little less than $7,000. One thing that the last year has taught us is the importance of our online presence. We have heard from members who have not been able to physically attend services because of age, inability to drive or uh, disability, who are now able to fully participate. We want to be sure that we continue that outreach. Last year, we budgeted $25,000 and spent it to begin some upgrades to our sound system and video capabilities. This year, we budgeted $27,000 to complete the process so that our online services can continue and expand even when we are able to gather in person. We also increased our pledge to COPS Metro modestly to $7,200. Many of our members are active in this organization, which has been extremely active and effective in making San Antonio a better place for all of us. Last but certainly not least is the 36,350 we allocated to capital improvements and maintenance. 
Those of you who attended the town halls got some detail on what we need to do first to get the campus ready for our return and second to take care of some much needed maintenance and improvements. There are funds available in some capital reserve accounts which will be used along with the 36350 We also recognize that the funds available from reserves and the budget will not nearly cover what needs to be done. There's an ongoing discussion of the possibility of a capital campaign, not for anything new, but to upgrade and improve our current campus. We put $5,100 in the budget for funding materials and help if a capital campaign comes to pass. The Finance Committee and the Board are confident that this budget is reasonable and fair. We have taken a conservative approach with both revenues and expenses. Thanks to your generosity, we now have the ability to look to our future with confidence and hope. I urge you to vote yes on this budget. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Tess Bobo. I have been a member at large on the board for three and a half years. One of my duties as a board member was to be the liaison to the Leadership Development Committee, or LDC. The LDC is responsible for many things, but one main one is to nominate people for leadership. Many considerations go into a nomination. Our current bylaws stipulate that a member must have served on the board within the past five years in order to be eligible to be president or vice president. This normally doesn't present challenges for the incoming president as they have in all likelihood served as vice president for a year. When the, where the challenge comes in is for the position of vice president. Under our current bylaws, the only available pool of nominees are those who served on the board in the last five years. What if all those people decline? It happens. Where does the LDC go from here? While it might be ideal for the vice president nominee to have recent board experience, it should not be the only consideration. We have many members with longevity who have served as committee chairs, perhaps more than once, or on multiple committees, or served on the board 10 years ago, who would make perfectly good candidates despite not having recent board experience. The current bylaw is too restrictive as it stands now. We propose that this sentence be deleted from our current bylaws. All this said, the board has developed a best practices policy for the selection of leadership within our church. We believe that this is the proper place to list the many permutations of experience any leader should have to be qualified to be a leader in this church. That policy is now available on our website. Thank you. What does a community agreement do for our First UU Church congregation? The community agreement proposed by the Committee on Ministry that you, as the congregation, had opportunities to reflect on and make comments, was presented to our board in April and unanimously approved. The agreement can support and facilitate clear expectations and the deepening of relationships in our congregation in five ways. First, it is a statement of agreement about how our members and friends choose to be in relationship with each other. When we live by these statements, we are modeling our Unitarian Universalist values for one another, our children, and the wider community. Second, it contains promises, not rules. Unlike rules, promises are discussed, lived, broken, and renewed. Promises and commitments describe how we wish to live together as a faith community knowing that if these promises don't work, our congregation may choose to rewrite them. Third, it provides a framework of expectations. 
Virtually every context we enter has behavioral expectations. Our congregation should be no different. In fact, given the reason that we come together to create a beloved community, clear expectations are vital. Fourth, it is about behavior, not personality. Behavior that encourages, nurtures, and supports our free and responsible search for truth and meaning is most important to the life of our faith community. Behaviors shape and reveal a person's character. Fifth, it offers an opportunity to explore and deepen our spirituality. Promises made to others in our faith community and the relationships that can form from such a practice can strengthen and broaden our commitments in deliberate, intentional, and disciplined ways. I propose that we publish this on our website, teach it in membership orientations and during specific Sundays with themes about behaviors and attitudes, including those when we celebrate new member joining ceremonies. Our community agreement begins with a preamble. In order to establish and maintain a sanctuary of safety and trust, these aspirational guidelines for our behaviors with each other have been created from our own experiences and for our own benefit. It is understood that our commitments may be made, broken, and restored as a part of our process of growth. Our community agreement is comprised of three areas of our life as a community. First, to support our mission, model kindness to promote justice, equity, and compassion, share time, talent, and treasure, honor our past, embrace change, and celebrate successes. Second, to communicate thoughtfully with others, practice patience, and look for good intentions in each other's actions. Learn from and listen to each other. Speak honestly from our own experiences and perspectives. Respect the personal nature of comments that others may share. And finally, to honor our differences. Resist making assumptions about one another. Work towards forgiveness whenever we fall short of expectations. Speak directly to each other or request mediation to negotiate misunderstandings. Welcome the diversity among us with curiosity, acceptance, and empathy. We'd like to share with you the latest news on our plans for reopening. Our coronavirus task force has been meeting regularly for a year. We'd like you to know that our purpose has been to monitor the science as interpreted by the CDC and to make our decisions based on their guidelines. There is a question which we get asked again and again. When can we congregate? We work regularly on procedures which have changed incrementally, yet our sites are aiming for our return to full capacity indoor worship services. It is our hope that all of us who can be vaccinated are being vaccinated. Vaccination is an easy way to be responsible to each other. We also expect that we will exercise personal responsibility by masking, hand washing, and staying six feet apart whenever possible. We are all a part of the interdependent web and hope that we will care for each other responsibly with respect and as a community of love. We are happy to share with you our progress in developing these following protocols. If your group or committee is fully vaccinated, you may contact our office to schedule indoor space for your meeting. Of course, outdoor space is available as well. We plan to continue holding monthly outdoor events, such as the Valentine's Day Senior Lunch, the Stewardship Sunday drive-through pledge event, and our Flower Communion Stewardship Celebration, each of which welcomed more than 100 adults and a few dozen children. Any and all groups 
covenant groups, committees, and others who want to meet outdoors on campus may do so by scheduling a time with our office to ensure that adequate space is available. Starting next Sunday on May 23rd, RE for Children will no longer be online, but will be held on campus outdoors. And we're planning to host a few outdoor services during the summer and hope we will be able to begin to hold limited indoor services in September. Dorothy asked for my thoughts on the future. As minister, I receive my formal authority as leader from you, the congregation, and the board. I serve as your chief missional and visionary leader. Our mission is our path, and our vision is the goal. Do I have thoughts on the future? You bet. Let me tell you about two elements of our exciting future. These include an assistant minister and securing our financial future and why we need these. Research shows that successful organizations must focus first on building a strong and broad base of leadership and paying for it and the programmatic initiatives that will follow from the influences of the leadership. Included, of course, is the improving and maintaining of our facilities and grounds. Here are five roles for our assistant minister. This is a professional leader that needs to be put in place and allowed to lead if our church is going to have an enduring success. An assistant minister will be a pulse taker, a trusted confidant for the congregation. An assistant minister will be a vision amplifier by reinforcing, repeating, and clarifying the vision. An assistant minister will be a leader multiplier by identifying, recruiting, and mentoring lay leadership. And one last element I look forward to having in our assistant minister is as a gap filler, a flexible, skilled, and prepared minister to serve in critical roles when necessary. Yes, I'm excited about our future, and I hope you will be excited too. This year, we have successfully raised the money to grow our budget, and that larger budget will be approved by you today. Now we can begin the process of searching for, interviewing, and hiring an assistant minister to add value throughout our church. Thank you for making this opportunity happen. Another part of this vision is growing our budget as a part of our secure financial future. That is a part of conversations we need to have about money and how a well-planned and delivered capital campaign can meet our needs for years to come. These two, expanding our professional staff and securing our financial future will transform our church into a beacon of light that we have hoped for and out from where we've been hiding under a bushel these many years, including especially this fallow COVID year. May we emerge. Now, shall we close our annual meeting? We extinguish our chalice, but not the light of truth, the fire of our commitment, or the warmth of our connected community. These we hold in our hearts and minds wherever we are. Thank you for your attention today. Thank you so much, Reverend Mark.
And with that, I adjourn our congregational meeting. We'll see you at church.